Right. Hello, students. Welcome to another video lecture for ComSci 125 Operating Systems. In this video, we're going to look into some policies regarding swapping. But before we proceed to the discussion of these policies, let's have a short review of the previous chapter. So in the previous chapter, we talked about the mechanism of swapping. The idea of uh, providing or implementing swapping is that it provides an illusion of unlimited memory access for programmers. And also uh, by doing that, uh, we are able to properly utilize the, the resources. So remember that a computing system has two main resources. We have the CPU or the processor or the core that is responsible for the actual computations. And we also have the storage wherein we have the storage hierarchy from registers, caches, main memory, up to the lowest level, which is the disk. So in managing memory, uh, the idea is somehow to provide unlimited access to unlimited memory is by introducing swapping. And, and remember, if you recall in our discussion about uh, paging, so the in, in the case of the physical memory, we break down the physical memory into physical page frames. And when it comes to swapping, the disk is actually, or the subspace or the backing store is actually divided into blocks. So, we can actually think of the page frame or the physical frame as the corresponding unit for the blocks in the disk. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about policies because as we've discussed in the previous chapter, when there is not enough physical memory available, then, and we still want to provide an illusion to the programmers of unlimited memory, we need to somehow remove some unused pages from the main memory and place them uh, on the disk to accommodate the pages that are needed at a given moment. So that is what we're going to look uh, at in this chapter. So let's proceed. So what we're doing right now is we are uh, working beyond the, the physical memory, right? So typical systems have, have eight gigabyte RAM, but we still want to have uh, more uh, memory access or access to more memory, especially if we have a multi-programming and uh, concurrent systems, okay? So uh, when a system is running, there will be some form of memory pressure, which will force the OS or the kernel to page out pages to make room for actively used pages, as I mentioned earlier. So the kernel will have to, uh, let's say the physical memory is getting food, so it has to put away some pages that are not currently needed so that we can bring in pages that, are, uh, that will be needed soon. So uh, the idea of deciding which page to evict is encapsulated within the replacement policy of the OS. So uh, this topic actually are, is uh, sometimes often referred to as page uh, replacement algorithms because you're trying to select which pages that are currently in memory will have to be paged out to the backing store or to the swap space. So essentially, we can since we we, we are not, what we are doing now is we are integrating the main memory and the disk together and treating them both as uh, a big chunk of memory available for processes. So with this mindset, we can actually think of the actual physical memory as a cache of the disk, right? So uh, 
that's how we are going to view these page replacement algorithms uh, in this chapter. So we view at, at this point, we, we merge the physical memory and the disk as one big chunk of memory together. But we know that uh, physical main memory is faster than the disk. So in a way, we can think of the physical memory as a cache of the disk. So that's what we're going to, that, that will be our view. And we need to uh, discuss some metrics about this cache mechanism. So the goal in picking a replacement policy for this cache is to minimize the number of cache misses, meaning we, whenever a process will reference a memory as much as possible, that memory should be in the physical memory. But since we have swapping, it's also possible that the memory being referenced is actually on the backing store or on the swap space or on the disk, right? So you have to remember that mindset. Then we can measure the number of cache hits and misses, which will actually let us calculate the average memory access time. So we are interested in the average memory access time, which is given in this formula. So we have uh, these uh, parameters for the average memory access time. Uh, P sub hit is the probability of finding the data item in the cache. So it's hit probability. And then, so the cache that we are referring to here, as I mentioned, is the main memory. And TM is the cost of accessing the uh, memory, the main memory, when we say accessing the time, it's, it's a unit of time. And then we add that to the probability of uh, missing the, the, of the data or the data is not being in memory, but rather on the disk. So it's called a, a miss. So there's a probability multiplied by the cost of accessing the, the time. The cost here is time of accessing uh, the disk. So obviously, the, the cost of accessing memory is lower compared to the cost of accessing the disk. Because at this point, we have an integrated view that when we talk of memory, we're not just looking at the physical main memory, but also the disk. So both of these will contribute to the average memory access time. And we're going to use this as a measure of uh, the performance, right? of the performance uh, and our goal, of course, is to minimize the number of cache misses because as you can see in this formula, the more there is a cache miss, it will actually magnify the, the cost of accessing the disk. So we don't want to always miss because it will increase the, the cost of the disk access. So we want to focus on this term of this, uh, of this formula. So we want this to be higher or actually lower, right? Or basically to more to have more hits than to have more misses because it will uh, affect the cost because this access is uh, more expensive than memory access. Now let's take a look at the optimal replacement policy. How, how do we determine the optimal? Because we are interested in the optimal, of course. So the, the main idea here is that it is possible, uh, it is good to know the optimal replacement policy, but in reality, it might not actually be easy to achieve because of some constraints. But let's take a look at the optimal replacement policy. This, again, when we say replacement, we are trying to select which page to remove from the cache or which page to remove from the main memory to make room for the pages that will be needed soon. So the optimal replacement policy, the main idea is to, of course, to minimize the overall number of misses. So the idea is to replace the page that will be accessed furthest in the future. So this is, uh, in a way, common sense, because if you're not going to use that page, 
in the future, say in the near future, you better uh, place that out to the to the disk or to the subspace. And this, of course, will result in the fewest possible cache misses. Okay, so that's the important thing to remember about the optimal replacement policy. And it's, as I mentioned, it only serves as a comparison point and is actually not, it's quite difficult to achieve, but we can approx approximate this later. So let's have uh, uh, a trace of how uh, optimal policy is achieved achieving the optimal policy. So we are given what we call a reference row. So these are actually page numbers, right? Remember that we have the virtual page number, right? So the virtual page number, these are virtual page number VPNs that are being referenced. Meaning, let's say you have a variable that is in page zero, you have a variable or a code that is in page one, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we if given this reference row and we assume that we have three slots, right? We have three slots for uh, the main memory or three frames available. Okay. So this is the main memory. We have uh, three frames uh, available. PFN zero, PFN one, PFN two. Right? So these are the available frames, free slots in the physical memory. So this, again, this will be the cache. So given this reference row, if we start with the, the access, we access zero. And when we access zero, if this is the currently the available frames okay, in the main memory, since uh, we access page zero, it is not in the in the physical memory, so it will be a miss. So there will there will be a disk access, okay? And once read, this will be placed in the main memory, in the physical frame. It will be mapped to a page frame number. Then a reference to page one is made. And looking at the main memory, it's not present in the main memory, so it will be added, so this will be the cache state. So remember, the cache state is the main memory. And then when we access this one reference, it will also be a miss, and this will be uh, placed also in the physical memory. So it will be given a, it will be mapped to a corresponding physical frame. Then we have the next reference zero, and Looking at the main memory, we see that zero is present. So this will be a hit. So no change in this, no, no page will be evicted at this point. Then one is also in the main memory. So uh, no page will be evicted. Then we have uh, three here. And looking at the main memory, we notice, we will observe that three is not in the main memory. So this is when the page replacement algorithm will have to kick in. Which among these three, uh, uh, three pages that are mapped will be replaced by three because currently three is needed by uh, a process, for example. So using the optimal policy, so we are at this point, and this is the reference row. Using the optimal policy, we try to look forward into the future. Currently, there are there is zero, one, and two. So over the succeeding references, which of these pages will be uh, referenced uh, in the near future? So you see here that zero will be referenced in the near, near future. So zero is not a good candidate to evict. Three is still not in the memory, so no problem. And then one, it's still, uh, one is reference, so it's better be placed here. And then two is the page that will be referenced uh, at the furthest uh, period of time. So the most likely candidate to be evicted will be two. And what will happen is two will be replaced and we're going to have three here. 
So the cash or the physical frame will now have zero, one, and three in the physical memory. Then the next uh, reference will be zero. So it's still in the main memory. Uh, then we have three is also in the main memory. Then we have one in the main memory. And then two, uh, two will be a miss. Right? Two will be a miss because it's not in currently we have zero, one, three in the main memory. So we have to select which uh, of what zero, one, and three will be ev evicted. So one will be a good candidate, uh, will not be a good candidate because it will be referenced next. So we have the choice of either uh, evicting zero or evicting uh, or evicting three. Okay. So uh, what was done here is that three was chosen, was evicted, and two was placed here. So this is now the state of the cache, and then. Uh, Lastly, we have reference to page one, and one is in the physical memory and in the cache. So that's the process of uh, tracing this optimal policy, but you get the idea. Now, in order to describe or characterize this policy, we can look at what we call the hit rate, because as I said, we try to maximize the hit rate. We want to have more hit rates than uh, more, more hits than misses. So given this configuration, we can compute that the hit rate is actually 54.6%, which is quite higher, high given this uh, reference row. Right? So this will now be our basis of comparison. So succeeding approaches, succeeding policies will be compared against this optimal uh, policy. But again, this is just a theoretical uh, theoretical policy. The implementation will be a little bit different because there will be some constraints. And that probably would be looking into the future because you really cannot predict what will happen in the future, what memory references will happen in the future. So let's now proceed to the actual possible implement, uh, possible policies that can be implemented. The first one is called the uh, first in, first out. So you are probably familiar with this. So pages are placed in a queue when they enter the system. Right? So I guess in the lab, a virtual memory simulation is what uh, was implemented. So pages are placed in a queue when they enter the system. When a replacement occurs, the page on the tail of the queue, which is the first one to uh, be added or placed in the uh, in the main memory, is evicted. So it is simple to implement, but can't determine. Uh, but it can determine the importance of blocks. So sometimes we have uh, uh, groupings of pages. Okay? So uh, it does not consider that. So let's have an example tray. So we, we still use the same reference, but this time we implement the first in, first out policy. And this is again uh, the cache state. Okay, so we're going to draw this. Uh, this will be the appearance of that. So zero will be missed. Okay, one will be missed. And then two will be missed. So this will be the appearance of the memory. And then zero will be a hit one will be a hit, three will be a miss. So if three will be a miss, we have to select. Now, which one of these three was uh, placed first in the memory? Of course, zero. So this will be replaced with three. So uh, the, the cache now will be one, two, three, all right? And we have zero again. So the zero will be a miss. So which one, which is the oldest in this uh, list? So it will be one. So this will be zero. So it will be zero or two, three, zero. Okay? So it will be two, three, zero. And then three will be a hit. Uh, one will, uh, will be a miss. Okay? Among these three here, which is the oldest? The oldest is two. So you replace it with one. So we have 301. And then uh, two is a miss also. So which among this the oldest, we have three. So we replace it with two. So the cache now will be zero, one, two. 
And then lastly, we have one and we get the heat. So we measure again the, the heat rate and we can observe that the heat rate here is 36.4%, which is lower than the optimal, uh, than the heat rate of the optimal bulbs. Okay, so that's clear. Now we also have a concept called Biladis or Biladis anomaly, wherein we, uh, the idea of the, this anomaly of course because, uh, is, uh, happens because obviously when we are looking at uh, the heat rate, the larger the, the larger the count or the larger the number of page frames, basically the number, the larger the cache is, we should, uh, we should observe that the heat rate will be higher, okay? Because we have more, we have more, we have more slots. So in this case, we have to say we have seven. So if we have more slots in our physical memory, meaning we have uh, available uh, page frames, we have a lot of available page frames, Obviously, supposedly, the, the heat rate should be higher. But this Biladis, Biladis anomaly actually is uh, the anomalous part is at this point. We're in, at, uh, if, you are, if you have uh, a memory with three frames available, say this one, the page four count is from three, it increases as it moves to four. So that is an anomaly because we are expecting that the page fault count, remember page fault will happen when there is a miss, okay? It should continually, the, the trend should be uh, downward, but this one here, uh, uh, there's an increase despite this, there is an increase in the number of page fault despite the increase in the number of available frames. So that is, of course, an anomaly. So this is the problem with uh, with FIFO because of this uh, of this uh, anomaly. Some corner cases actually uh, happens because of uh, some corner cases have not been captured, resulting to this anomaly. Now another uh, policy is the random. So. Uh, in the in the world of algorithms, random is actually uh, good, and we've also talked about this when we talked about lottery scheduling. Right, so when we have random, a random number. So basically, the advantages of uh, randomness is you don't have you are we are able to skip to escape corner cases. Uh, it's easier to implement because we we don't need to maintain a lot of state, etc. So uh, for the random policy, you pick a random page to replace, which is when we are under when the OS is under memory pressure. So it really doesn't uh, it doesn't really try to be too intelligent in picking which blocks to evict. So no, no intelligence, just pick a random number. Why that page will be uh, uh, evicted? So essentially, what uh, the when you run this multiple times, you get different results. But of course, we are interested in the average or in the long run because it depends on the random randomness that uh, is being uh, 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 manifested okay, with random number here. So this is an example uh, uh, example trace, okay, but uh, it did not show, I will just leave the, the calculation of the hit rate to you here. So basically one, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So five over eleven. That will be the the hit rate for this for this run of the uh, random policy. If you run random the next round, another round, it will of course yield a different result. But of course, we can average that uh, for several runs to get uh, a good feel of the hit rate of random. So here is, uh, okay, here is an example run and some measures. So sometimes random is as good as optimal, achieving six hits on the example tray. So 
let's say uh, let's say we have this this is the example trace the reference row and we run random uh, several times and then we observe that uh, the number of hits okay actually uh, increases because in the optimal one two three four five six six is the number of hits and if we use random at some point it will hit this uh, number of hits, which actually the given the reference, the reference uh, row, okay, said it earlier, will yield the this same number of hits, which is the which is from the optimal after performing ten thousand trials. So at some point you're going to hit this. So that's that's great, right? So yeah, those are two simple, uh, two simple uh, policies when it comes to page replacement. Now, it's also possible to uh, be able to decide more intelligently if we have more information. We can decide to select which uh, page to evict based on the available information that we have. And what information is by using the history? The idea is to learn on the past and basically use the information learned from the past to determine which space to evict. There are two types of uh, historical uh, information, two types of historical information. Uh, the first one is recency. The more recently a page has been accessed, the more likely it will be accessed again. So that's recency. So, for example, if you use this variable uh, in your code, then most probably later on that variable will be used again. So that's uh, recency. So the algorithm for that, which we will discuss later, is LRU or least uh, recently used. The other one is frequency. If a page has been accessed many times, it should not be replaced at, as it clearly has some value. So let's say this particular page has been uh, uh, accessed many times, meaning probably there is some data in it, okay, and that is being used in a computation, then that is frequency. So the algorithm for that is the uh, least uh, frequently used. So let's talk about this algorithm, algorithms, okay? So recency and frequency. So let's start with the LRU. So again, we have three slots for the physical frame, three available frames, physical frames. So the same reference row. So we start with uh, zero. So zero is a miss, so you get that here. Uh, then one is a miss, so you get that here. And then two is a miss, you get that here. Okay, and then zero, this will also be a hit, okay? And then one will be a hit, and then three will be a miss, right? Now again, using LRU, which one is the least recently used page? So we can mark, uh, let's say this uh, one, zero, one, two, and then this one is used. So let's, let's put a dot here. Uh, one is used, let's put a dot here. So that means, we are going to replace two since this was not recently used, uh, not recently used. So we, we will replace this and we will have on the memory 013, which is actually 013. Then uh, this is a hit, so we mark it as a hit. And then uh, three is a hit also, we mark it as a hit. And then uh, one is a hit, okay, and then Two is a miss, it's not here. So we observe that uh, zero has not been recently used. So we replace zero. So we put it in two. And then lastly, we have one which is also hit. So how many hits did we get using the LRU? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, which is actually almost the same, which is the same as the number of hits in the optimal replacement policy. So we can see here that LRU is actually 
uh, very near to the optimal replacement policy. Now, uh, there is no example for LFU, but you can try. You can try. Uh, you can try using the same reference row and come up with your own table and measure the heat rate. Right now, the succeeding slides will discuss the behavior of the different page replacement policies based on the workload. So the reference row that we've been using here as an example, uh, probably may be random or this is a, this is a synthetic, uh, synthetic uh, example of memory reference, page references, page references. So you can take a look at an example workload and uh, this example workload will observe uh, just by just visualizing, uh, viewing the graphs, the behavior of the different algorithms. If the workload has uh, no locality, when you say no locality, meaning uh, every uh, every access to the page will be a a a, a miss. Okay, so. Uh, a workload accesses 100 unique pages over time, right? So these these are what is presented here are just graphs, so there is no actual traces. So uh, you choose the next page to refer to at uh, random, so with, without uh, any locality. So and this is the resulting uh, graph. So uh, I don't know if you can see this, but the general conclusion here is that when a cache is large enough to fit the entire workload, if you have 100 pages, okay, uh, it also doesn't matter which policy you use. Because as you can see here, as you increase the cache size, or basically you increase the number of frames, uh, the hit rate, okay, they are almost the same if the workload has no locality. So, the page replacement algorithms will usually be uh, effective if the workload shows some uh, locality. Remember, recall that we talked about temporal and spatial uh, locality in the previous uh, chapters. So this will be the appearance of the graph. Now, if the workload is 80-20, when we say 80-20, it exhibits locality, meaning 80% of the references are made to 20% uh, of the page, meaning uh, uh, you have uh, a set of pages, okay? and then 80% of uh, uh, the references will just focus or will just access those 20%. Uh, so let's say we have 100 pages. And the first 20 uh, of those are, uh, are referenced in, the, in, this, uh, in the reference row sample. So that's what you mean by 80-20 workload. And uh, the remaining 20% of the references are made to the remaining 80% of the pages. So, so this example workload uh, exhibits locality, meaning uh, it accesses the same set of pages, let's say pages one to 20 for the reference row, okay? So this will be the graph, okay? And the main conclusion is that the LRU is more likely to hold onto the hot pages. When you say hot pages, these are the pages that are commonly used, uh, commonly accessed with, as I mentioned earlier, the first 20, for example, if you are given 100 uh, pages. So LRU is most likely to hold onto the hot pages, right? To place them in the physical uh, memory as you increase the the as you increase the cache size or the number of frames available. Okay, so the looping sequential. So this type of workload uh, you have you refer to fifty pages in sequence. Okay, so let's say. You have 100 pages, for example, and then you refer to page one, page two, page three, page four uh, in, in sequence, and then you loop again. Okay? And uh, 
this will be the uh, the plot of the different uh, algorithms uh, and uh, you can see that uh, the heat rate for I cannot uh, see the color here but it seems that the <laughs> LRU okay uh, is not uh, performing well here okay but the random is performing here in this uh, in this manner so that is the behavior if you have uh, uh, a looping sequential workload so uh, we have given this uh, discussion how do we implement now the this algorithm so uh, theoretical discussion is okay, but eventually, since we are uh, working in systems, we do have to implement them. So what are the things that we need to implement these page replacement policies? So to keep track of which pages that have been leased and recently used, okay, uh, the system has to do some accounting work on every memory reference because we have to maintain state. We need to know, as, as I was uh, doing the example here, I have to place dots here to specify uh, uh, the time that a particular page was referenced. So this dot placing here actually in, is a state, right? The state. So we do need some uh, uh, hardware support for that, the dots that I was making earlier, right? So to approximate the LRU, which is, we think is the best, Okay, because it, uh, it is near optimal. So it requires some hardware support in the form of a USB. Okay, be sure this is the that I was doing a while ago. Whenever a page is referenced, the USB is set by the hardware to one. So, it's, so uh, when, when providing hardware support, we also have to consider the cost. Okay? So, and the information that we want to, to store, let's say uh, in this example, we're just using a single bit. So basically a single wire, which will have a signal of zero or one. So this is called the use bit. So whenever a page is referenced, the use bit is set by hardware to one and the hardware never clears the bit. So it's the hardware that sets the bit to one, but it's the operating system that clears this bit, right? So that's how we approximate the uh, least, uh, recently used so that at least we know uh, that a particular page has been recently used. So this use bit is, uh, uh, is used in what, uh, in an approximation to LRU, which is the clock algorithm. So all pages of the systems are arranged in a circular list, okay? and a clock hand points to some particular page to begin with. Let's see how this works. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, these are the pages available in the system. The algorithm continues until it finds a use bit that is set to zero, okay? So let's say at this point, uh, uh, the clock hand is pointing to B, okay? So uh, it will check uh, whether the use bit of B is zero or one. If it is zero, that page will be evicted, will be removed from the uh, main memory, okay? And that's it, okay? And then if one, if this is one, okay, it will uh, clear uh, the use bit and then it will move, it will advance the, the hand. Okay, so when the page for the course, the page that the hand is pointing to is inspected, the action taken depends on the uh, the use key. Okay, so that's so you evict the you evict the page, okay, and if it is uh, zero, okay, otherwise you you clear that and then you move on to the next until you find uh, a bit a use bit with zero. Okay, because it is the hardware that sets, remember the hard, it's the hardware that sets the USB, but it is the OS during a page fault 
for the page fault handler that clears this feed. So uh, using the 8020 workload, meaning there is uh, ex, uh, ex, uh, the workload exhibits locality, but the, the clock algorithm doesn't do as well as perfect LRU, but it does better than a pros that don't consider history at all. So remember, this is the optimal uh, FIFO and random do not consider history or the not maintain state. LRU is the uh, theoretical algorithm, but uh, when we implement them, uh, we, we to approximate LRU, we have uh, the clock uh, algorithm. And you will notice that LRU uh, somehow uh, uh, they are close to each other. The clock algorithm approximates the LRU. And uh, next is dirty pages. Okay, so considering dirty pages. So uh, it's also possible that uh, a page is dirty. Remember, it's, uh, it's, uh, the operations, two operations can happen in a memory area or in a page right, or a frame. One is reading from it and writing into it. If you, after swapping in, if you load a page from the swap space to the physical memory and then you just read that, that data, then that page is essentially untouched because you're just reading data. But if you write something to that page, that page becomes dirty and we can in the hardware can include or actually has a modified bit, also called a dirty bit, that tells us whether that page was modified or not. Okay? And usually, if uh, a page is dirty, we can actually uh, write it back to this to evict it. Okay, so uh, in in using dirty pages, what we're doing is to we try to evict those pages which are dirty because essentially we have to write them to this for uh, for 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 fault tolerance, okay? so that we can have a, a consistent or a, a backup of the contents uh, on the disk okay? in case something happen happen. So. Uh, However, if the page has not been modified, then uh, do not evict that particular page. So page selection policy, the OS has to decide, which the kernel has to decide when to bring a page into memory and uh, we have different uh, options, right? Uh, when, uh, which page to, to bring to the memory from the subspace or the backing store. Okay, so <clears throat> once we've evicted, uh, once we've evicted a page, a dirty page or whatever, uh, based on whatever page replacement policy that is in effect, we need to bring in, we need to bring in a uh, page, uh, new, uh, new blocks from the disk to the, you, we replace that to a corresponding physical frame in the main memory and then map the, the page number to the physical frame or yes, that's the idea. So uh, the, there are several options and one is called prefetching. Okay? When you say prefetching, even though a page or a block, a page on the secondary storage or on the soft space is not needed, uh, we try to load them already uh, on the physical memory, uh, hoping that since uh, they are somehow located uh, near each other, they will be accessed uh, in the future. So to conserve some time, because we know that this creed and this write are expensive operations. So if we can increase the size, the number of blocks that we can uh, we can read from the disk in one shot, the better, okay? So in prefetching, the OS gets that, uh, that a page is about to be used and thus brings it in ahead of time. 
So here, for example, uh, page one is needed. So page one is the one that is currently needed. So uh, instead of just bringing page one to the physical memory, it will also bring page two. So with just uh, one IO request, it brought up two blocks or two pages to the memory. Although, for example, only page one will be used. Okay, because uh, it will probably the page two will probably be used also later. And we can also have uh, clustering or grouping. So uh, we collect a number of pending writes uh, together in memory and write them to disk in uh, one write. So I mentioned a while ago about dirty pages. So if we have a lot of dirty pages, instead of each uh, instead of uh, issuing a write request for a dirty page, we try to batch these uh, dirty pages so that in one IO request, in one write, we, we get to write a lot of, of dirty pages. So this is an example. So uh, instead of individually issuing uh, IO request to write each page, we group them together in one request and then write that to the secondary storage to, uh, to conserve or to save some requests and of course save some time because we group together uh, several dirty pages uh, into a single IO request, IO write request. And I think this is the last slide, right? So sometimes as, uh, Again, the, the advantage of uh, letting uh, programmers or programs request as main as, as uh, a large amount of memory, unlimited amount of memory, there's a tendency to uh, oversubscribe. You say oversubscribe, if you have eight gig of RAM, then the processes eventually requested 12 gigs of RAM, right? But since we have a shopping mechanism, 12 gigs of RAM is still possible, but we now have to use the, the, the backing store, the stop space. We, the, the OS can still give the processors 12 gigs of RAM in total, even though there's, there's only 18, uh, eight gigs of physical RAM. So there is an oversubscription for that. And uh, some things uh, you will observe basically the, uh, a different behavior, a different system behavior. So uh, the system should be able to, that scenario is called a thrashing. So this is a form of a threshold. So let's say uh, this is eight gig RAM, but at some point uh, you load a lot of other processes. So in total, you are using 12 gigs RAM. So there will be, uh, you will observe that your system will be doing, the disk will be active. The disk will be active, and that is called uh, that scenario is called thrashing, and uh, uh, the system can up not uh, can decide not to run some uh, other processes, or uh, it can perform some operations to clean up uh, to reduce the number of processes so that uh, only those that can fit in the memory can uh, run. So that's essentially the idea. So you will observe this, that if you open, you can, uh, if you're running a system, Windows, for example, you open a lot of tabs, you open a lot of, uh, of applications, even though you only have a limited uh, amount of physical RAM, your program will still run, the applications will still run, but they will be very slow because of this uh, thrashing event. There will be a continuous uh, swapping in and out of pages from the, from the subspace or the mapping store to the physical memory. And what do you do? You close the programs that you are not uh, using uh, at the moment so that you'll get more, uh, you'll get a better performance because at least everything is in the main memory, so it will be faster than uh, loading the, the pages from the disk or from the subspace. Okay, so that will be the end of this chapter. See you on the next chapter.